Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk about an article that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, January 7, 2021. It was written by Drs. Welsh, Mazur, and Adamson of the Departments of Public Health and Pathology and Dermatology at three different major universities. The title of the article, The Rapid Rise in Cutaneous Melanoma Diagnoses. It calls for need to reassess the screening that we do says maybe we're making a diagnosis of melanoma when we really shouldn't. Maybe we're over-diagnosing the condition. And certainly, the incidence of melanoma is rising quite dramatically. Melanoma is the third most commonly diagnosed cancer in the United States right now, just behind cancer of the breast, cancer of the lung, about 200,000 cases being diagnosed. About half of them are invasive, half of them are non-invasive, just on the surface of the skin. So they don't pose a threat at that stage. The incidence of melanoma has increased by about six-fold over the period of the past 40 years. That's more than any other cancer. Cancer of the thyroid, it's increased three-fold. Cancer of the breast, we all talk about, increased by one and a half times. You can see that the incidence of invasive melanoma started off at somewhere around eight per 100,000, 1975. Now it's way up there at about 25 per 100,000. On the other hand, the incidence of melanoma in situ basically wasn't diagnosed in 1975. Now it's diagnosed as commonly as invasive melanoma. That should tell you something, that we're making diagnoses of conditions that might be made up. So the question is, do we have a true epidemic? Is the condition so common that it's causing more people to be at risk of dying? or? Do we have a diagnosis that is really now an epidemic of overdiagnosis? Are we really diagnosing melanoma in people for whom treatment isn't going to cause any benefit? Are we diagnosing people who don't have the same prognosis as we think of with malignant melanoma? First case of metastatic melanoma diagnosed in 1804 by Lenec. He was a French physician interesting physician. He was the gentleman for whom cirrhosis of the liver was named. He developed the stethoscope. He diagnosed black diffuse tumors, various anatomic locations. But now we know that melanoma can arise from melanocytes. And melanocytes, wherever they are, can cause malignant melanoma, not just on the skin. Yes, that's the most common. But we also have non-cutaneous melanocytes. So we have melanocytes in the mouth, in the nose, in the eye, in the anus, in the vulva, in the vagina. All of those areas can develop malignant melanoma. You can see the incidence of the non-cutaneous melanoma basically hasn't changed substantially. Incidence of cutaneous melanoma increased quite dramatically. Well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that we can see the skin surface, so visual inspection and routine screening can detect more of the cutaneous melanoma. What's caused melanoma? Well, it seems to be the sun. So, if it's the sun, then we ought to have an explosion as we have more people exposed to the sun. Actually, the first link of sun and melanoma was from Lancaster in England where melanoma was diagnosed in Europeans who migrated to Australia. Subsequent studies either supported or rejected the hypothesis. So it's a little controversial. But you have to realize that ultraviolet irradiation is almost universal. Everybody's going to be exposed to a significant amount of ultraviolet radiation, even if it's just to your face if you go outside. You might have a long sleeve shirt, long pants on. You might work in the sun. You might go spend time at the beach. Well. In spite of the fact that ultraviolet radiation is almost universal, melanoma, in comparison, is relatively rare, and death from melanoma is even more uncommon. So the association of ultraviolet light and melanoma comes from case control studies. Those aren't very good. And they're subject to what we call recall bias. So you diagnose somebody as melanoma, say, hey, did you spend any time in the sun? Yeah. Okay, so that's an association, supposedly.
Well, the true incidence of melanoma from sun exposure is thought to be maybe increased by about 30%. From chronic sun exposure, on the other hand, doesn't seem to be changed. So if you work outside and you're outside all day long, it doesn't seem that you're at higher risk for melanoma. On the other hand, intermittent sun exposure seems to increase the risk by about 60%. Now, the type of sun exposure most associated with malignant melanoma is sunburn. But even then, sunburn increases the risk of melanoma only about twofold. Now, we've excoriated tanning beds, and we say that they're extraordinarily bad. On the other hand, every use versus never use of tanning beds increases the risk of melanoma by about 20%. Frequent use of tanning beds increases it by about 40%. First use of a tanning bed before you're age 35 compared to after age 35 increases by about 60%. So the association of melanoma with ultraviolet radiation isn't particularly strong. At most, it's about a doubling. And on an epidemiologic basis, a doubling isn't all that impressive. But the incidence of melanoma has increased by about six-fold. Now you can see that if basically we have the entire world, everybody goes and gets sun exposure and they get sunburn, you can see that you only doubled the incidence of melanoma on the other hand. The blue line at the top shows the observed incidence considerably greater. So it seems that even if you accept the fact that sunburns cause melanoma, at least in certain subfraction of the population, that doesn't explain anywhere near the rise in melanoma at the present time. Well, you have to look at the association, you have to look at the risk factors, and the magnitude of the risk and the change in the proportion of the population exposed to whatever the risk is, that seems to make a difference. So no matter how strong the risk factor is, if you're not exposed to it, Theoretically, you shouldn't get the disease. Well, consider cigarette smoking. Basically, those people who develop lung cancer, chances are, are going to be cigarette smokers. Now, you can get lung cancer if you're a non-smoker, but the overwhelming majority of people with the disease are cigarette smokers. And cigarette smoking increases the risk of lung cancer by about 20-fold. So the incidence of lung cancer would be relatively stable if the incidence of cigarette smoking stays stable in the population. If there were no tobacco in the general population at the present time, well, after several decades, the incidence of lung cancer would go down. On the other hand, if there was no smoking, and now everyone started smoking, the increase would be about 20-fold. So we have a natural experiment, because smoking was basically non-existent at the start of the 20th century. It peaked at about 50% of the population in the mid-1950s. So the incidence of lung cancer, 50% of the population, with a 20% increase in risk. So that's a 10% or tenfold, tenfold increase in the risk. So that's quite substantial. And we know, again, less smoking is going to decrease the risk. So if we translate that now into skin and skin cancer and melanoma, we know that with more screening examinations, if we have a decreased clinical threshold to biopsy the lesion, and we couple that with a decrease in the pathologist's threshold for making the diagnosis of melanoma, we have everything it takes to make an epidemic. And now we have a situation where the percent of fee-for-service Medicare beneficiaries having at least one skin biopsy has increased quite dramatically from 2001 to 2017. So if we look at people who are over age 65, you can see the annual incidence of Medicare beneficiaries undergoing at least one skin biopsy has increased quite dramatically. And you see that the incidence of melanoma has risen as well. Now we have another experiment. And the other experiment is a review of skin biopsies, 40 skin biopsies, that were performed 20 years ago. And we have nine dermatopathologists who are going to read those slides. Many of them read the original slides. So we have diagnosis 20 years ago, and now we have the diagnosis now.
And at the present time, it seems that many of the same lesions that were interpreted as benign 20 years ago are going to be interpreted as melanoma today. Very few of the lesions that were diagnosed as melanoma 20 years ago are going to be diagnosed as non-melanoma at the present time. So if you look at those 40 slides, about 5% were downgraded from melanoma, 25% were upgraded to melanoma. So, what's that mean? That means that there's a gray area. It means there's a gray area between the diagnosis of benign moles that are what we call dysplastic. They have some atypical features in them versus actual thin melanomas. That's the gray zone. And if we look at those original 40 slides, about 11 of the cases were diagnosed originally as melanoma. Now 18 of those cases are diagnosed as melanoma. And again, many of the dermatopathologists were the same ones who were making the diagnosis. Some made different diagnoses then and now. And it might surprise you that there's no definitive diagnostic criteria for the pathologic diagnosis of melanoma. It's a subjective condition. So depending on which pathologist looks at the slide, you might get a different answer. And there's a big gray area in between, between benign and between malignant. So now what we have is we have a situation where a lot of bi the diagnoses are being made on very thin lesions, thin lesions, small lesions. And unfortunately, there isn't enough to make a good diagnosis. So we have a combination of subjective criteria, we have asymmetric incentives for the pathologist. If you make the wrong diagnosis, if you diagnose the lesion as benign, when the person had melanoma and the melanoma spreads and kills the individual, you're going to get sued. On the other hand, if you say something is melanoma when it really isn't, then you're not going to be penalized for overdiagnosing the condition. And on top of that, we have all these small, ambiguous lesions. And now we have a tendency for some of the dermatologists to refer to their own laboratories. And when they refer to their own laboratories, for financial reasons, typically, well, the number of biopsies is going to go up, going to go up by about 25% compared to those skin doctors who are referring to outside laboratories where the incidence of bi diagnoses or biopsies doesn't really change. And now we have another situation where we, we have the corporatization of medicine. So we have a lot of these deep-pocketed groups and hedge funds going and buying dermatology practices. They consolidate them. They open their own pathology laboratories. So now we don't have basically the outside review. And remember we said that melanoma in situ is a significant problem. It's a significant problem because it's often diagnosed as melanoma and the incidence has increased by about 50 fold since 1975. It used to be 0 0.5 per 100,000, now it's about 25 per 100,000. But the identification of malignant melanoma in situ doesn't change the diagnosis of invasive melanoma. Malignant melanoma in situ is not a regular precursor, and certainly it's not an obligate precursor. It doesn't have to get to be an invasive melanoma. And if a person has a melanoma in situ, that's not a sign that they're going to die of melanoma. As a matter of fact, we have a stable mortality from malignant melanoma. So even though that incidence of malignant melanoma in situ has increased, 50-fold over the past 40 years, the incidence of death from melanoma has stayed basically the same. So if we're making the diagnosis a lot more, and if the diagnosis uh, does not lead to death in more people, then that's sort of the definition of an overdiagnosis. So the percent of lesions that are diagnosed as metastatic, and let's put quotes around the word metastatic, at the first diagnosis has increased recently. But why has it increased recently? It's increased because now we do all sorts of tests that we didn't do many years ago. We do the PET scans and the CAT scans and we do all these other things that allow us to diagnose small lesions that have theoretically spread.
that 40 years ago didn't cause any problem and wouldn't cause any problem now, but now all of a sudden we're diagnosing invasive and metastatic melanoma. But you look at the death rate again and you can see the mortality is the same now as it was in 1975. It hasn't changed in spite of the fact that the incidence of diagnosis has increased quite dramatically. So we have another situation. And the other situation is because the diagnosis is increasing so much, everybody knows somebody who has melanoma. There are all these news stories about melanoma. People talk about melanoma. You see the public service ads, go get your skin screen, screen because you don't want to have melanoma. And as a result, we have anxious people going to see doctors because of these lesions that are pigmented, that are nonspecific, nondescript on the surface of the skin. And there's basically no reward for saying, oh, the lesion's okay, don't worry about it. Because remember, if the doctor diagnoses something as benign and it turns out to be malignant, well, then there's a significant penalty, a lawsuit. So as a result, a lot of lesions are biopsied now that really don't need to be. So we have the lower threshold getting people to the doctor's offices and the asymmetric incentives for biopsy and non-biopsy. Sometimes we have the doctor's own laboratory. So all of this is increasing the reason that we do the screening, supposedly, because we can decrease on paper the incidence of death. But if you're biopsying a lot of lesions that wouldn't cause any harm in the first place, and you're saying that, whoo, the incidence of uh, death from melanoma is going down. No, 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 no. You just have to look at the numbers, the real numbers, and you can see the incidence of death from melanoma is not changing at all. Now, in the last 40 years, we haven't really seen a substantial change. And the reason we haven't seen a substantial change is because s more recently, we've had the advent of some very good therapies, some immunologic therapies, biologic therapies for melanoma. So we have to consider what's the threshold for biopsy. Well, it typically was the lesion had to be at least as big as a pencil eraser. But now people are diagnosing just little tiny small spots on the surface of the skin. And worse yet, they're looking through the dermatoscope. Dermatoscope is just a magnifying glass, basically. And they're finding all these little irregularities. And they're magnifying them. And they say, oh my goodness, that's atypical. And they're making the case that the lesion needs to be biopsied. And now there's a talk of artificial intelligence diagnosing pigmented skin lesions as melanoma. That's going to lead to a disastrous increase in the incidence of lesions. And what we have to do is we have to get the pathologist to help us out. And we have to consider renaming melanoma in situ Maybe melanotic neoplasm, that would be a good name for it. Maybe that might help reduce the overdiagnosis because people wouldn't be talking about all these melanomas. We did the same thing, by the way, with papillary thyroid cancers. Now we call them thyroid neoplasms. Because remember, the incidence of diagnosis going sky high, incidence mortality staying basically the same. Well, if you're diagnosed as having a melanoma. Can you say that that's just safe? You did it for precaution? Yeah, you can say that, but you have to consider that there might be some harm f undergoing some of the testing. So you have a scar, potential for a wound infection, potential for cost. If the cost is out of your pocket or the insurance company's pocket, it's ultimately going to lead to an increase in the rates of the insurance, and then you're going to pay the price frequent surveillance, so you go into the doctor's office now twice a year to get checked. You're paranoid about all the other pigmented lesions on the surface of your skin, and people who have legitimate skin lesions can't get in because it's crowded out by people who are worried about their skin. The skin lesions, the pigmented lesions, people feel vulnerable. There's the lack of resilience that some people have. Some people find still that it's more difficult to obtain health insurance, life insurance. And at the present time, the idea is that we should stop the population-wide screening for skin cancer.
The United States Preventive Services Task Force says that the current evidence that we have that we're doing benefit really isn't able to balance the evidence of harm. So we don't know whether we're doing good or we're not doing good by all of these skin cancer screenings. Now, the COVID epidemic finally stopped the skin screening, skin cancer screening episode that the American Academy of Dermatology had launched. It was called the Spot Knee Campaign. They spent lots of resources to encourage members of the American Academy of Dermatology to hold free skin cancer screening clinics for the public. Two million people were screened and the incidence of melanoma, the crude incidence, where the suggestion was that there might be a melanoma just by the doctor looking at the lesion, was more than a thousand per hundred thousand. That's a 20-fold increase in the incidence versus the age-adjusted incidence of the disease. So what can you say about skin screening? It's going to make a lot of false diagnoses. It's going to send a lot of people to doctors for a lot of biopsies. And now we have volume practices, volume practices where they get incentives for more screening. More screening means more patients, more services used. And we give out a scary message. So the bottom line is, cancer is, yeah, it's a scary disease. And malignant melanoma fits in right with the scariest of lesions. So we're all sensitized to the idea that any irregularity in a pigmented skin lesion is reason to see a doctor, especially if it's asymmetrical, if it's irregular border or color, or if its diameter is larger than the pencil eraser or if it seems to be changing or evolving. Those are ideas that should take the person to see the doctor. There's no argument about being safe rather than sorry, but the evidence is quite clear that we're changing the criteria for diagnosis, we're changing the criteria for clinical and pathologic diagnosis. And as a result, we're making a lot of diagnoses that are inappropriate and combine that with a lot of people who aren't as adequately trained, maybe some of the PAs, some of the other paramedical personnel who are making the diagnoses and then leading off to the biopsies. And that puts us squarely into the realm of overdiagnosis. So if you had diagnosed lesions that won't impact your life, well, they're really better left alone. All you can get is harm from treating them, you don't really get any benefit. So we're on a slippery slope right now. And remember, the United States Services Preventive Task Force, that's the group that advises on what's appropriate medical care or not in the United States. They say there's not enough evidence to support screening for melanoma. But that said, if a lesion's pigmented and suddenly changes, do see a doctor. And remember, the material I just spoke about was basically from an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, January 2021, Dr. Welsh and his group. But it's really what I've been saying for the past several decades. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend, consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.